um, feedback on design. Um, I personally don't have a lot of feedback. It looks looks all looks all fine. I mean, the overall scaling makes sense. I personally like Apache, and I don't say it like that. I don't like Apache, but the, I don't hate Apache, so it works. So it it works. So that's fine. If if, if PHP seven is supported, absolutely, it's a lot faster. Um, MariaDB, Galera, as you said, um, there's, we support Oracle, we support Postgres, um, but MariaDB, Galera cluster setup seems to be the most popular one nowadays. I think that's, that's a good choice. Um, SSD makes sense. Have you said something about caching here? Redis? No. So we would absolutely um, recommend that you use a, to use a Redis for caching here. I think in the reference architecture, this is only added in the biggest tier, if I saw it correctly. So, but we could, you can absolutely use it in your in your setup too. So this is really recommended. Yeah, we actually did, did uh, took it with us in the planning phase, but I forgot to put it here. Yeah. And that's um, used for overall caching of Nextcloud and also for session management. It's just a lot faster. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to say about the load balancer is um, just that it's clear here there is, because you mentioned at the beginning that um, SSL termination should happen in the load balancer. It, it can, and it's a, a common setup, but there are always two choices. There are two, two ways to do that. You can terminate SSL in the load balancer, or you can terminate it in the, at a web server. And there are pros and cons for both scenarios. Actually, terminating, it, terminating SSL at a web server is probably cheaper to scale. Because at some point, you need a bigger load balancer, especially if you have a hardware one. And this is like a single instance. And for scaling, having a single instance is always bad. But web servers are easier just by another node. So terminating any other web server might be cheaper and easier to scale. The drawback of that is that you have an encrypted channel going through the load balancer. So the load balancer can't see the data, which means the load balancer can't do things like uh, sticky connections, that a certain request always goes to the same node or can't do other more intelligent ways to handle the traffic because it, it's still encrypted at the stage. Oh, but how do we, I thought it was the offloading, so. Yeah. So we don't worry about uh, HTTP to, to uh, the on-cloud servers or uh, HTTPS with, with, with the low encryption. That's what I thought that meant the SSO for them. No, I mean, you need to terminate SSL connection at a load balancer yeah. or at a web server. Yeah, but you said that it went uh, it through the load balancer. If, it, if you terminate it at a web server, then it goes through the load balancer uh, encrypted. And you can't read cookies, for example, or other things at a load balancer. Yeah. So there are pros and cons for both approaches. I just wanted to mention that this is something to, to keep in mind. Um, it has some benefit to, to, do, to use something like sticky connections that a request always goes to the same node because then you can use local caching. You can say, for example, the session management is just local on this machine. And every time, I'm sure Frederick has some feedback there, every time you do something local, it's always better because then it scales linearly. If you um, have to maintain a Redis cluster, and every request has to go through the network to this cluster, get back and forward. You always create this. I'm not saying it's bad. It's a recommended setup, and it's fine. Now just to keep in mind, the more you can do local, the better it scales. Why are you using or recommending Maria? Uh, I've, 
I don't want to go into MySQL versus MariaDB discussion. I don't know. <laughs> Both works fine. And This is, why I, this, is, this is why I said I don't want to go into this topic. I don't. I think in the next cloud context, there is no there is no difference that I'm aware of. But I just want to point out that the reason why we're here is, is that uh, frankly started of post uh, multiple licensing and all this stuff. So Okay, let's uh, move on. <laughs> My statement is still valid. It doesn't matter for Nextcloud. Both works. <laughs> Maybe then, uh, the same question in, in our uh, on, on your recommendation pages, you say MySQL, uh, yeah. MyDB, which is the same. Uh, or only supported, but not recommended. So why not? Sorry, so, so we're talking about large installations. My infrastructure runs are very expensive. Yeah. Large yeah. Large yeah. Installations, so, I don't use so Oracle absolutely works. There are big installations who use it and they're happy with it. Um, when we did these recommendations, um, the goal was to come up with something which fits most scenarios. And in my experience, there's only a relatively small percent of people who are fine buying Oracle licenses. And this is why I didn't put like Oracle as a recommended database in there. But if you're happy with it and you want to use it, it's absolutely fine and it works and it scales well. It's just not, a, it's just, I wouldn't call it the standard solution. It's just a bit more expensive and more complex and difficult to use and so on. As people use Oracle, the more happy you can run the Yeah, it's not a <laughs> device test. It works, but. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a systems uh, provider. I, I need to serve my customers. Yeah. And if, if they provide me with recommendations or requirements that, that make me use Oracle data, yeah, sure. I want to use it to everything I can. It, it, it works, and that's the main reason why we support it. Because there are people that have their giant Oracle setups for thousands of euros that they want to run it, so it works. But then, I have you supported wholeheartedly or you 
you say, okay, it's an easy and actually we don't want to do it, then leave. Yes. Yeah, then, then it's, 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 it's fully supported. Everything works in it. We're on a unit test of Oracle. I'm just saying that as a developer, I don't like programming against it. But that's, that's my problem, not yours. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want me to pay money, actually, I, I don't particularly care. <laughs> the thing is, these recommendations that you shot earlier. So maybe what we wanted to achieve with that, because at the beginning of as own cloud, we had like lots and lots of different things that you can use, right? Like the software supports, I don't know, all kind of crazy setups. And then we noticed that people deploy crazy setups. So what we wanted to do is we make a distinction between what works, and then we wanted to have a few like templates uh, blueprints, because when people come to us and say, I want to run this, but I have no idea what we should do, then we say, that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do it like that. This doesn't mean that it's the only way to do it, but it's like the, it's like the yeah, it's the recommendation. There are no bad intentions here. This is probably just missing, and we will fix it. Well, it's one of the of this to yeah. The I mean, it's like maybe it's an maybe it's an artifact of the former project, <laughs> where where the policy was that Oracle is only for enterprises, but the code was actually in the community edition, but n no one was told how to use the code. It's a weird situation. But then the Mindfarm website where uh, Rocket was not recommended. Yeah, from the yeah. whatever. Uh, next load, it's fully supported. You can absolutely use it. We f should fix the documentation. Absolutely. It's just not something that Oracle is, in my opinion, I don't know if you agree, more for something who, for people who know what they're doing a bit. It's a more. It's more a more grown-up database in a good way and in a bad way. It's very powerful if you know what you're doing. You have the money and the knowledge and everything. It's great. If not, then maybe use something simpler, which might be, I don't know, that's my opinion. But it's fully supported. OK, next question. I think this boils down to the question if you can replicate an Active Directory via LDAP. I have no idea. I don't know. Um, maybe later we should ask Arthur, who is the expert here. I mean, as far as I understand, Active Directory is only a different schema on top of LDAP, so it theoretically should work, but I don't have no idea. Sorry. What would you recommend for storage systems? I mean, that's... Um, oh yeah, what, what is a site in your context? What's a site? Uh, a data center. A data center. Yeah. So two sites means uh, two data centers. Yeah. So, so okay, yeah. <laughs> so that this doesn't work at all. <laughs> no. So we have this wonderful slide here. Um, <laughs> next slide works. Next uh, next slide works like that. There's a, a web draft request or HTTP request coming in here, going to a load balancer, then it's, um, then it's de um, forwarded to a web server here, and the web server is also the place where the Nextcloud code runs. Right, and there's a request coming in, like upload this file, please, for example. Then the Nextcloud code here starts to run and does all kinds of things checks like the credentials if they're correct against an LDAP server, checks um, if the path is there, if they're the right, right permissions of the path, um, then if this is a shared file, maybe then it actually should go into a different storage. Um, 
then um, if the upload is done, it sends out maybe a notification mail to the one who shared the file, maybe puts an entry into the activity feed, maybe before that checks if the upload is possible in the first place with the file firewall rules, and so on. So there's a lot of things happening in Nextcloud here. And these things result in several uh, database queries and several um, requests to the storage system. And there's a lot of stuff going on here, also with Redis. And if everything is done, then basically the request ends and goes back, yes, file upload successful. So this is how it works if you do a simple file upload with WebDAV. Okay? So the thing is here that all those SQL queries that happen here, there's a lot of like read and write requests, update requests, and so on happening. And also, um, basically on the storage, where you maybe you create a subdirectory, uh, put a file into a subdirectory, you check if the parent directory is there, you check the end time, and so on and so on. A lot of things happening. So, if, and this is actually the same here, if the database or the storage is, has some kind of synchronous replication with like, for example, a Galera cluster, that's fine or some other storage which has some kind of synchronous replication, it's all good. But as soon as you have asynchronous replication, it falls apart. Because then you might run into situations where you, you put something into the database, and then a millisecond later, you, se you do a select, and it's suddenly not there. Because you do the query on a slave, and the replication didn't happen yet. Okay, or the same with the storage. You, put, you upload a file, and then this file is somehow asynchronously transferred to a different data center, and then a millisecond later, you want to check like the, the inode or something of the file, and then the file is not there because you read from a different node and replication didn't happen yet. Okay, so this, this just would fall apart. So this whole asynchronous replication which is mandatory if you talk about different hosting centers, it just doesn't work. So the only way if you want to have a, an own cloud, next cloud instance distributed over different sites is that you do it with our federation concept. That you have an instance on one hosting center with, a, with its own storage, with its own database, with its own application and load balance and the same on a different hosting center and they are connected via federation. So one user can share something here and it pops up on a user on a different site. This works. But you can't, if you start to somehow do, I don't know, the most extreme and most stupid example of a customer once was that they had like two hosting centers and they had an rsync cron job which just <laughs> synchronizes the files between those two hosting centers. You see the problem, right? There's a, you upload a file and suddenly not there anymore because suddenly you look on the other side and it just doesn't work. Federation is more on a higher level of the stack. So the way, for example, it works with Skibo, that uh, 25,000 users, they're actually running, I don't remember, 10, 20 different universities on their site. And this instance is distributed over three hosting centers. And what they did is they basically took, take that 20 universities, split them up into three groups, and assign them to different hosting center. This hosting center, University A, B, C, and D is running. Other hosting center, other universities are running. And every university is its own single entity, own single entrance. But if a, if a user from one university wants to share something with a different university, 
in the normal web interface, in a normal sharing dialog, you can just type in the user of this other university, or even with the latest version we are, we are developing, even can do auto-completion. You can find the user on a different, different university, you say share, and then those two instances talk to each other, and every time I access a file that's shared with me by someone of a different university, it's basically proxied through one Nextcloud server to the other, fetches the file, does all the activities, fetches it back, and serves it to the user. Exactly. I, um, I, I completely understand the question, and I discussed this for five, six years, and I just, I just, I, I'm not aware of any architecture, and that's the same for Nextcloud and OwnCloud and PyDeo and CFile and everyone. I'm not aware of any architecture where we can deploy one instance over three data centers and you can basically randomly switch them on and off and connect the connection between them and the user has no downtime. I'm not aware of that architecture. And this would be possible to do with GFS. With GFS spectrum scale, it's kind of possible to do an answer because yeah, replication. Your files are there, your files are safe with your database. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't want to go super deep into the technology, but just a bit. What, we, what it's needed is a kind of replication system that replicates transactions, and a transaction has to be a combination of file system changes and database changes. You have to bundle file system changes and database changes together and replicate those in an atomic way around. And I'm not aware of... I looked into Hadoop for a while because they actually have like a... But it, I'm not aware of something like that. Replicating files is fine, that's not a problem. Also, replicating databases is also fine, but you have to replicate them together. Let's talk about it later. It's, 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 it's tricky. It's tricky. Yeah, but then still with, still with, no, still with active passive, it's still possible that an SQL query is replicated and the file change is not. And then you have a broken instance on the other side. Latency. Yeah. Just a bit faster. Uh, are there any advantages to use this um, local? There are lots of questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we should move on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, what would you recommend for storage systems? Well, uh, yeah, we answered that. Okay. Yeah. Docker, I, I don't know. I mean, one strategy, one, another change we want to do at Next, Nextcloud, because we fight it with Linux packages for a long, long time, and it's really hard. We definitely want to um, distribute Nextcloud more in container form maybe Docker, but of course the challenge is then, again, people want to have different setups, not every container is the same. If you look into the GitHub Nextcloud organization, we already have two official Docker containers. That's the mess already starting. Um, so it's...
If you take our code and put it into a Docker container, then it's supported. But it's you, it's your container. It's I mean. Yeah. In virtualization, we have similar problems. The render stage, uh, we support you, but if you cannot reproduce, we need it in raw. I don't, I don't know how much nowadays now. So what about Docker and how much impact can Docker instance have on the behavior of an application? Because if you cannot reproduce in your system, then suddenly you start saying, okay. Uh, we have a Docker system, we cannot reproduce it, make it in real world again, and then we can support it. Or it's, it's the same as the virtual machine, it's just a full operating system stack. And as long as you can reproduce a full operating system stack, it doesn't matter when it runs a container or for a But if you cannot reproduce it, then... So we can... It's probably it's easy to reproduce it, Docker, because you can just take it over. I want to support that says, uh, fix it for me, but I will support it. I run into a problem and I say that I run into Docker. I don't want to get asked about well, don't use Docker. That's, that's the, the main reason we need to add Docker to it. You won't hear this from us. I'm also not aware of, Maurice, correct me if I'm wrong, of any bug that it somehow could be triggered by, by, by a container, by using a container. I don't know. I'm yeah, it's also not open debugging. You try to make use of all down here. To just extract layers to say, okay, I don't want to depend on a VM or hypervisor to be sorry about it, and then to bear that, to rule out that this is the call, and then you just take out as many layers as possible until you have found this. How then the debugging works, and I guess we will also support you with doing this to fix your issue. We had the bigger customers that had huge performance. 
Apache Engine X and Docker, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter for Nextcloud. Shouldn't matter. Okay, so Switch has this interesting setup. I saw this um, in, in different. <laughs> I saw this in other instances too. So the, um, some some people have the uh, configuration where they, are, for example, in a load balancer, implement a rule based on the user agent and say all the sync line web dev requests go to these boxes, and other requests go to other boxes. Um, you can do that. It's I'm not really sure why it makes sense. I think it makes sense because the sync client doesn't need, from the user perspective, it doesn't matter if the sync client is a bit slower. Even where I interface, if I click a button, I want it to respond immediately. If my, web, if my sync client takes two more minutes, the sync client changes if you may, and the chair would be done. Maybe, yeah. Um, documentation recommends to this rel, mention SUSE, Ubuntu, Debian, Center as an open source. Do you support all those OSs and why not? I, as discussed earlier, it, I mean, most customers want to have a fully supported stack. They want to have support for the hardware, for the operating system, for the database, for the storage, and for the application layer, which would be Nextcloud. And they're only happy if they have the full chain of support for everything. Yeah. And because of that, you usually don't want to use something like OpenSUSE, where you can't buy commercial support for. From our perspective, it works totally fine. A lot of our developers use OpenSUSE. It's, it's, it's totally fine. It's just if you ask us what should we use to have a fully supported platform, fully supported service for everything, then you probably want to go to RHEL, um, SLES, or Ubuntu server. Just yeah, as far We love to see object store. OwnCloud does not offer a solution. It actually works for our size installation. Also, there's no migration path from NFS to object store yet. Oh, God. That's a long topic. <laughs> OK. So first of all, to be a little bit nitpicking here, you can, of course, use an object store, even switch using an object store, but with an NFS gateway. But OK. What they probably mean is, use directly Swift or S3 to directly talk to the object store instead of going through NFS first. Um, and this is supported by Nextcloud, same as OwnCloud here. But um, there, is some, there is some few things to say. And this is a bit more like my personal opinion. I would actually love, this is a great topic for a bit of a discussion. People might think that things are faster because they are an object store. But there are just a few things that need to happen. Um, if you want to handle files, which we want to do, is then what Nextcloud does, we provide a POSIX file system view to the user. So you have in the web interface, you have, a, you have directories, you go into directories, out of directory, upload files, you have M times, you have MIME types, you have all kinds of things. You have a full POSIX directory tree. And it's also accessible via WebDAV, and this is also what we sync to the desktop. 
we provide a POSIX file system tree to the user. Somewhere in the back end, you have, of course, data blobs. Could be sectors on a hard disk, or could be objects in an object store or something, where you have like key values. You have an ID and data, an ID and data. Okay? And somehow, between those two things, you need to map this. You need to map like the sectors to the tree structure. And this mapping is usually called a file system. And that's what the file system does. It maps like blocks to a tree structure. Okay. And this needs to happen somewhere. And this can happen in different, different layers of the stack. Right? You can use an NFS gateway on top of uh, Ceph. Then this NFS gateway does exactly that. Or you can use S3 and Swift directly from Nextcloud, and then Nextcloud actually does that. So in this scenario, Nextcloud implements a file system. So we have a full file system implemented in PHP in Nextcloud. And all the metadata, all the inodes, and all the directory structure and everything is then stored in our database. In our database, then we have like, this is a folder, and there's a subfolder, and there's a file in the folder, and it has this size, and has this M time, <clears throat> and so on and so on. And the data of that is then somehow mapped to an object, which is then comes from an object store. So in both is possible. I'm personally, even if I, of course, like Nextcloud a lot, I'm not sure if Nextcloud is the right place to implement a file system. I would implement it somewhere else. But it's still supported and it works. But what people don't, shouldn't expect is that only because we inject the term object store here somewhere, somehow and do some swift communication, um, that it somehow is faster than using an NFS server. It's the same work has to happen, just in different places of the stack. That's my opinion. I can't say. I mean, this leads to, a, to really a lot of database load. Then it, the question is then how do you scale the database? I can't give a good answer to that. So um, we were actually talking about that. Actually, it was on the, on, on the latest um, uh, roadmap, somehow um, dropped out, that we provide a script to migrate from object stores to NFS back and forward. So this is something we want to do, that at least people can try it and have some flexibility. I personally wouldn't expect any wonders only because you directly talk with Swift to a to Ceph store. I don't know. Because the thing is also, also with object stores. I mean, this, the theory is object stores is, of course, that it scales perfectly, right? It's, you have like key values, and then you have some kind of mapping of keys to nodes, and then you need more storage and more performance, no problem. Just double the number of nodes, and you change your mapping, map, mapping, and then you have like more performance, and it scales linearly. Great. But this is only the case, of course, if you have a complete random access of all the nodes at the same time, which is in reality not really the case if you talk about a file system, because you want to access, for example, the root node a lot, and the sub, 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 sub node not so much. So even with this object store, you might up ending up in situations where we have like hotspots of access. You might have one Ceph node is totally overloaded and the others not. So it's, I, I don't know. I'm just a bit critical of this object store does wonders theory. 
I talk too much. Other opinions here? <laughs> yeah. Frederick, you have a lot of opinions about that. And, uh, I mean, in a sense, you don't doubt. Reason about this call, you say that it creates the fire from, from uh, Swift or uh, S3 inside a pocket, right? Yeah? Sure, you can do that. That's was another thing that we discussed and tried in the past. I can, okay, just get rid of the database and store everything in, in, I don't know, however, as a JSON blob, or I don't know, in one object, in the object store. I am not, I not. Think, <laughs> I, I think not to expect any wonders for anything. Yeah. It's possible. You have roughly, in my experience, a factor of two of overhead in the manifest just because yeah. So, I don't know if the object store is better at that. Perhaps expect some performance gain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Uh, yeah. Hardware load balances. Nobody seems to use them. I think it's. I think we already covered that. Yeah. Is here and why is it so cover that too? Um, I think I think the current large recommended architecture that we have here is it only scales to a certain limit. And if you reach if you want to have more users than that, then I would recommend the thing that Skibo does, break it up into sub instances. And then you can scale all every instance on its own also on different hosting centers. And for that, you don't really have a limit. There's, at this point, there's no limit anymore because the federation, basically, server-to-server -server communication, it's linearly, right? So sure, it's double the users, double the shares, double the network load, sure, but beside that, there is no limit. Sure. We want to implement this multi-bucket feature um, that there are, I'm not really an expert here, but there are some scenarios, I mean, especially the Amazon S3 implementation, I think, where you have a maximum bucket size. And in this case, it's really bad to have everything in one bucket, and because of that, we support multi-buckets in the future. But, yeah. Um, what should we use for multi-site deployments? Um, yeah, we we'll covered that, yeah. SQL scalability. Yeah, I mean, there's absolutely a limit, right? I mean, at the moment, a lot of people seem to use the Galera cluster architecture. And I haven't really looked into that too much, but I assume after a certain number of nodes, maybe even more than four already, I don't know, it doesn't really scale anymore. Because, as I said before, this is synchronous replication, which means every single change, every single insert has to be distributed to all the nodes before the transaction is, can be completed. And you have your more nodes, it doesn't scale anymore. So um, scaling database is hard. At some point, super expensive or impossible. So because of that, after a certain time, you have to break up instances into in smaller ones. Yeah, if you go over this 100,000 limit, 100,000 user limit that we have here, I mean, if you're more than 100,000 users in one instance, I would recommend to break it up into two instances with two different databases. Sure. I mean, scaling, my perspective, means perfect scaling Perfect scaling, my perspective, means linear scaling, which means you only need double the hardware for double the user, not more than double. That's the ideal situation. But I can't think about a situation where you need less than double. Yeah, That's... <laughs> Sure.
ça, ça. It makes sense. It makes sense. So, so Nextcloud is running in lots and lots and lots of small isolated processes. So every single request going to a Nextcloud server is one process. Because of that, it perfectly scales over lots and lots of CPUs and memory. Um, what should we use beyond the petabyte support AOL? Uh, this is EOS. Uh, yeah, oh, oh, this, okay, sorry, didn't get it. Um, it's. Let's talk about it during BR. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's like solutions like Dcache and, and, and ERS, which are great. And that they are great if you're really big and if you really know what you're doing. I think a Dcache and EOS installation is nothing you can just quickly do. It has a lot of complexity to it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's great technology, but it's, yeah, big, big guns. Yeah. <laughs> this is fine as long as it's synchronous. If it's standard MySQL MariaDB replication, then this will fail. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. That's like Galera. Yeah. Also, Master Slave is fine as long as it's synchronous. Like one node of the Galera cluster? Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't know. I can't answer that. That's a Galera cluster issue, I don't know. Where should Redis run? Shown as a separate, um, it's drawn as a separate box. Would you use Docker deployment to run Redis in Docker? <laughs> uh, so as I said before, we don't really care how you deploy the software. You can run it as Docker or not. That's OK. Yeah. So you have two choices. You can run Redis, a central Redis cluster for all your nodes. Then, of course, you have some network latency to have all to talk to this central cluster and back and forward. Or you can run it locally, but then you need to have sticky connections. A request always of one user always goes to the same instance. Also now with the REDIS application, we have multiple levels of caching in next cloud as local and distributed caching, which you can configure separately. So with local caching, you do it on a machine, with distributed caching, make sure that every that it's either like replicated or you have one central Redis cache. But it's a separate local caching that doesn't hold this that holds like Central states, which you can just use from the on the application server. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. thanks a lot for the for the questions. <laughs>